Hello everyone. My name is Ashish Rastogi and today I will talk about our assessment process while reviewing generic injectable drug device combination products. But before I start with my part of the presentation, here is a brief, uh, brief message from Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. And I'll let you go through the next five slides on your own. So you may ask, what is the purpose or importance of uh, our assessment process with respect to combination products? Well, the assessment process is important to ensure that the generic form is therapeutically equivalent to RLD. That is, it has the same clinical effect and safety profile as the RLD under conditions specified in the product labeling. And this will enable the generic form to be freely substituted for its RLD. So with this thought in mind, we came up with following objectives. The objectives of today's presentation is to discuss various aspects of quality ass assessment of a generic combination drug device product. And we hope that with this information, and the applicants will be better equipped to submit quality information to FDA, which in turn will reduce assessment time and hence will lead to faster approval of generic parental drug products. So to meet our objective, let's start from the very beginning. That is, what is a combination product? A combination product is defined in 21 CFR 3.2 E as a combination of two or more regulated components and these components can be a drug, a biological or and or a device. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll limit our discussion to combination products where drug device are the constituent, uh, constituent parts and specifically we'll talk about injectable combination products. Please also note that different centers in FDA could be lead centers for a combination product and for a drug device combination product. When the primary mode of action is that of a drug, CEDAR is assigned as the lead center. What are the different types of drug uh, device combination products? So we have three uh, categories mostly. The first one is where the device is pre-filled with the drug. An example for this would be a pre-filled syringe. Second type would be when the device is co-packaged with the drug product. And the third type would be when the device is separately distributed than the drug, but both the drug and the device are labeled for use together. So these are the three types that we in CEDAR receive for our ANDA assessment. Now let's talk about the actual ANDA assessment process. So an ANDA assessment in general comprises of review of quality, labeling and bioplan sections of ANDA submission. For combination products, BCR is also part of the assessment process as they are responsible to review comparative analysis part of the submission related to the device. Please note that labeling, bioclins and DCR, they fall under Office of Generic Drugs, whereas quality falls under Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. And as I'm a, a quality assessor, so most of my discussion today will be based on the quality assessment. So a quality assessment of a drug device combination product can be divided into two parts. Quality attributes pertaining to drug substance, drug product, microbiology, manufacturing process and facilities are handled by assessors in OPQ and CEDAR. For CEDAR-led combination products, we 
OPQ assessors in OLDP and OPMA, we may create consoles for our CDRH colleagues via a process called as inter-center consult request or ICCR and we may request them to evaluate functional or performance attributes of the device. And we may also request them to perform assessment of device quality systems if necessary. And my colleague Steve Hertz from OPMA will actually talk more about facilities assessment in the next presentation. So let's first talk about quality attributes. A quality assessment begins with review of module 3 to S when an applicant is expected to submit all relevant information pertaining to drug substance such as physicochemical properties, impurities, drug substance specifications and so forth. For a combination product, drug product quality assessment involves assessment of critical quality attributes of the drug product and assessment of functional attributes of the device. This is also referred to as performance testing. For an injectable drug product, the critical quality attributes, most of them are actually mentioned in USP1. So this is a summarized version of USP1 where I've listed all the universal tests that are uh, highlighted in this chapter. And please note that we, uh, we actually advise ANDA applicants to follow USP1 very closely as it is regarded as the Bible for injectables. So as I said, like, you know, these are some of the universal tests mentioned in USP1 and USP1 also has list of parental dosage form specific tests. For example, an injection solution, which is uh, supplied in a pre-filled syringe for that combination product. Some tests such as glide force or break loose force may also be required to be part of the drug product specification. USP1 and other uh, relevant USP chapters also provide common guidelines for packaging system for injections. And this is irrespective of the fact that whether the drug product is a combination product or not. It is our expectation that the ANDA applicant will provide all relevant information pertaining to packaging system such as sterility and container closure integrity testing qualification of container closure system uh, per USP 381, USP 660 and or USP 661 as appropriate. Then information on glass delamination per USP 1660 if on applicable. Although we highly recommend and the applicants to provide all applicable information related to extractable and leachables per USP 1663 and 1664, please note that during our assessment, we actually employ a risk-based approach. So what does that mean? This means that in general, drug products which may qualify as low risk for extractable and leachables, such as sterile powder for injections and simple aqueous solutions, for those combination products, conformance to USP 381 and 87 or 88 may just suffice. However, please note that this information on this slide is not prescriptive and you as an ANDA applicant is highly encouraged to submit all the relevant information for our quick and timely review. For combination products that may, pro, uh, may, that may present high risk for extractable and leachables such as a prefill syringe, for those products, it's business as usual. That is, we encourage and recommend ANDA applicants to closely follow USP 1663, 1664 and provide all information as necessary. Please also provide us with correct AET calculation. And if you find that any extractable is greater than AET, please also submit a corresponding leachable study. 
in the leachable study if you see any leachables more than calculated AED then please also provide supporting stock studies to deem the risk from leachables as low. So this discussion was on the interaction of drug product with the device. Now let's talk briefly about what are our expectations with respect to the device. For the device constituent part of combination product, the assessment requires uh, evaluation of performance testing during the shelf life. And as we in CEDAR, we do not have the expertise to evaluate functional attributes of the device. We frequently consult our colleagues over at CDRH via the ICCR process. The CDRH assessment, briefly, I'll, I'll go over uh, this part very briefly. And the CDRH assessment involves evaluation of different aspects such as dose accuracy, break loose force, and glide force to ensure that the device performance is maintained throughout the shelf life. We also have a guidance which is closely followed by uh, industry and also by CDRH assessors during their evaluation. Hence, I would highly encourage new and existing and the applicants to follow this guidance during their development studies. Last but not the least, as part of CDRH assessment, there may also be need for facilities that is device quality assessment. And as I mentioned before, my colleague from OPMA uh, Mr. Steve Hertz, he will talk more about this in his next presentation. So before I close out, I would like to present to you this challenge question. And uh, the question is, which of the following is an example of a drug device combination product? Is it A, pre-filled with a drug, B, co-packaged with a drug product, or C, separately distributed but labeled for use together. We also have an option D, which is all of the above. So I'll let you take a couple of moments to uh, decide the answer. And yes, you are right. The correct answer is all of the above. At the end, I would like to sincerely thank my division director, uh, Dr. Benkai, my brand chief, Ms. Beta Mirzai Azam, and my fellow secondary assessors and QLs, uh, Dr. Kai Kwok and Dr. Reynold Tan, for their most valuable input during preparation of this presentation. And they say that life comes full circle. Similarly, this presentation also has come full circle. And by this, I mean that I would like to conclude with the same objectives that I started with. That is, it is our hope that this discussion has uh, made various aspects of quality assessment of a generic combination drug device product apparent. And with this information in hand, and the applicants will be better equipped to submit quality information to us, which will reduce our assessment time and will hence lead to faster approval of generic parental drug products. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Great. And Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear. Transition over to Stephen. And Stephen, let me go ahead and give you control of the slides, and you should be all set. Okay, great. Can you hear me, Jeff? Sure can. You speak up a little bit, but otherwise you sound great. Sure. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in, to, for connecting today. Um, like uh, she said, I'm going to talk about more of the GMP and post-marketing safety uh, requirements for combination products. And so um, in general, oops, sorry, we'll go back one. 
in general, combination products seem to be a confusing area for a lot of people because, you know, we spend our whole careers working on the drug aspects or the device aspects or the biologic aspects. So the goal here is to unlock these kinds of products. And, you know, the numbers three and four are definitely going to be part of this uh, unlocking. Um, some larger numbers, 820, 211, even some numbers with H's, that, that seems kind of strange, but I, I assure you all these numbers are important for uh, unlocking combination products. And you may, you may also feel overwhelmed where, um, you know, what is a combination product? You know, there are cedar-led combination products like we described already. There are device-led, like drug-eluting drug stents and catheters and other kinds of coated uh, materials and then even biologic-led um, um, combination products. So you can see quickly how complex and how different the different uh, requirements are for uh, having a uniform regulation for these products. Usually when I present about combination CGMPs, it's a real, real dense presentation. You may feel full afterwards, a little sleepy. Maybe you want to take a nap. Maybe you feel nauseous, depending on your experience. But uh, today, my goal is to give you bite-sized, uh, easily ingestible um, content and tidbits that you can use at your discretion. So we'll talk about GMPs and safety reporting, a little consults, a little uh, medical device single audit program. Um, please look at the references at your, uh, on your own time. Uh, I've linked to a lot of good primary references for you. So I hope uh, you, you take the time, read them, and uh, better understand combination products. So the objective for this talk is to give you some updates in the world of combination products, to get a little more detailed into what part four actually says, to give you some actionable information for CEDAR-led submissions, including ANDAs, uh, some device-specific info for those that uh, are interested in it, and then a summary at the end. So the core regulation for combination products in how they're defined and how the products are uh, um, led by the different sensors goes to 21 CFR Part 3. I've linked to the regulation, the preamble, and there's actually a proposed rule which modifies and revises some of the definitions, uh, talks about biological products, um, some, some additional uh, requirements in terms of requesting uh, product jurisdictions. So, I, I encourage you to check out these links. And in addition, for part four, uh, there's the regulation, and it was first written and finalized in January of 2013, which focused entirely on GMPs. And then more recently, a couple years ago, they added a subpart B, which is the post-market safety reporting. So I've included links to the preambles of both those areas, the guidances for both those areas, and FDA was actually involved in the American Association of Medical Instrumentation, I believe. Uh, they published a technical report in 2015, which also has some good information about Part 4. So in terms of some updates, uh, a lot of recent uh, big legislation that was passed includes combination product information, uh, in including the 21st Century Cures Act. Section 3038 talks about combination product innovation, uh, uh, requ requiring uh, the agency to, uh, to work on primary mode of action, meeting requests, consults, uh, interactions, so a lot of different things to uh, uh, improve the business um, uh, workings of combination products. And a, a big part of that, too, was to create a combination product CGMP variations, I'll call it a list. It's a Federal Register notice where there are some information where FDA has described how it will allow for some um, of these regulations, which I'll talk about in, in the next section, about how there's some flexibility that you can comply with them, not to the exact letter of the uh, previously written 211s and 820s. So that's an important link. I would encourage you to check that out, too. Uh, more recently, there was the FDA Reauthor Reauthorization Act in 2017, and there was a section which dealt specifically with competitive generic therapies, 
and there was language in there talking about having collaborative, coordinated review of combination products. So uh, the FDA spent a lot of time writing SOPs, uh, improving our consult systems uh, in response to these acts that were written. These are some uh, SMGs, which are staff manual guides that were specifically updated within the last couple of years for combination products, in, in, uh, talking about consult processes, uh, agency, cross-center engagement, and human factors consults. So uh, there's also a 4102 SMG, which talks about generic combination, uh, not generic, sorry, genetic combination products, uh, but that wasn't updated recently, so that's why I left it off. And now talking about Part 4 specifically, so the original uh, content of Part 4, Subpart A, talks about for combination products, if you have a drug which should comply with 210, 211 GMPs, and you have devices which should comply with 820, they're called quality system regulations, QSRs, Part 4 attempted to describe how if you manufacture these products, you don't have to comply with both in full if you don't want to, but you're allowed to take a streamlined approach. Um, and for us as uh, generic uh, cedar-led products, what we're concerned with is that for these kinds of manufacturers, you should comply with full 210, 211, and then additional uh, quality system regulation callouts. So not all of A20s, but these four or five as applicable regulations for your facilities. And just to be complete, this list would be for if you're manufacturing a device-led combination product and follow A20, you also must comply with these elements of 211. Subpart B talks about post-market safety reporting for combination products, a newer um, uh, regulation subpart that was added. And it talks about having complete and consistent reporting for these products, appropriate post-market surveillance. Uh, the intent is to avoid unnecessarily, unnecessary duplicative reporting requirements, and then clarify how these different requirements apply to combination products. This rule applies to both the combination product applicants, the ones submit, submitting uh, applications and submissions to the agency, and then also ones that only submit constituent part applicants. So if you make a device that is to be marketed under a combination product uh, application, but then also its own application, its own uh, uh, you know single center application, uh, this rule applies to you. And it applies to the reporting requirements um, as, as specified by the different uh, centers. So for CEDAR, uh, new drug and abbreviated drug, you have 314. For BLAs, you have the 600s. And for devices, you have these 800 regulations. Uh, the regulation describes individual case safety reports and what they are, and then how you should um, what information you should provide for those reports, and then non-ICSRs, and uh, how to uh, use the appropriate regulations and guidance. And it talks about how, how, it, how the reports, if they're submitted, can be streamlined into one submission versus multiple submissions. And so here is a uh, table that would help uh, describe the specific reports that are needed um, for us as ANDA um, submissions, submission holders, uh, you would focus on the red if it includes a device part, or the green if it includes a biological part. So you must, uh, in addition to your normal 314 um, submissions for safety reporting, you must also have 83.3 uh, .3 and those other ones for five-day reports for ICSRs and also malfunction reports. And then for non-ICSRs, um, any kind of correction or removal reports that is required for the device. So these can be streamlined um, into submissions, and it's talked about in um, the, in this part in this subpart of Part Four. And then for the biologics, you must also submit uh, BBTR, BBDRs, and other um, adverse events reports as needed. So in summary, there's a lot of good resources that we have for you uh, as an agency. I linked to some of them back in slide eight to the preamble and guidance. And the FDA has created a really good uh, resource webpage for PMSRs, so I encourage you to look at this if you're interested. 
In terms of CEDAR-like submissions, so we have the different centers, CEDAR, CEDAR, CDRH, and CBER. We also have the Office of Combination Products, which is in the commissioner's office or, or close to it. I don't know the exact uh, org chart at the moment, but they uh, manage and triage, uh, you know, product jurisdiction requests, requests for destinations, and they're the uh, overall driver of combination products in the agency. And um, they gave a presentation last fall uh, for the combination product industry, and here were some interesting slides for the previous fiscal year, uh, which they um, had done some numbers. So in terms of intercenter con consultation requests, which are the ICCRs that I had shown before, um, they intended to increase over those fiscal years. And as you can see, the primary requester is CEDAR, primarily requesting CDRH consults for their products. Um, but there is a, a healthy number of CDRH requests to CEDAR and CBER also. Just um, it's, it's about half uh, what the CEDAR sends. And then um, in terms of uh, additional information, um, uh, original combination product applications actually for that fiscal year decreased, but I'm sure uh, this, this, this 19 and 20 fiscal years, uh, we've seen a healthy amount of combination products on our uh, desks. Um, and as you can see, uh, Cedar is still the lead of these products, of these submissions. And as you can see, uh, most of them are uh, INDs, but then also ANDAs. So ANDA combination product applications are a high majority, uh, very close to it, of all the different uh, combination product applications we see at the agency. In terms of cedar led submission updates, um, I think uh, others have alluded to this, but there has been an update to the pre-approval inspections compliance program. Uh, that's the number uh, above there. And it was implemented last September. Uh, and it's, it's a very important document. It's what we use as a guide during pre-approval inspections in terms of coverage, in terms of uh, looking at um, conformance to the application, conformance, uh, conformance to the application, readiness for commercial manufacturing, and data integrity. So it tells you areas that we focus on during inspections, and it also talks about areas that we have concern with when we had to decide to potentially uh, withhold or delay approval for observations that we see. So that link, if you're unaware, is very important if you're uh, considering submitting a pre-approval application. And then also, a couple years ago, there was a, a document that was published uh, between CEDAR and the field ORA, we, we refer to it as CONOPS, Concepts of Operations, and this is a link that describes uh, pre-approval surveillance and for cause inspections. It gives you a lot of information about how those are conducted and who is, re who is the lead, who is assisting, who is responsible. Um, it's, it's very useful information if you have to manage or, or uh, respond to on-site inspections at your facility. And as Rose uh, alluded to a couple minutes ago, there have been updates to the uh, administrative form, 256H, uh, for in terms of facilities and uh, product information. Uh, the form and instructions were updated in 2018. Um, and, they, and as part of that update, there are specific fields for combination product info. Um, you must check yes if it is a combination product information and give some additional clarification. Um, in terms of information for establishments, uh, Rose went into it about having manufacturing, packaging, and control facilities for the drug substance, drug product, and combination product. Uh, and you must also include device constituent part manufacturers and specification developers. And there was also the level two guidance for industry that was published last October, which gives you more information about what to add to this form. And again, Rose talked to you about it before. Um, this is a link that will take you straight to this uh, guidance. Now, in terms of uh, device-specific information, um, you might be aware that Cedar went through a reorg of its own last fall uh, as a response to the new drug modernization effort to uh, streamline uh, you know, review and assessment of, of applications and of products. Uh, CDRH itself went through its own reorganization last year, um, doing a life cycle approach, and they are now uh, uh, titled as OPEC. And now FDA has OPEC also, uh, Office of Product uh, something quality, I forget. But 
but they're a life cycle organization where uh, certain offices handle from pre-approval through surveillance. Uh, they do all that uh, review themselves. So if you're interested in how CERH has reorged recently, check out this link. There is also another initiative where the FDA and other uh, regulatory agencies and bodies are attempting to transition to a ISO standard for quality systems regulation, uh, this, this 1345, uh, 2016. And so uh, it's very important because it is FDA's intent and others' countries' intent to uh, evolve or to, to jump from their current uh, quality system regulations to this ISO standard. Um, it's it's a, you know, obviously a very large effort, a multi-year effort, but there are some links to this. Uh, it's called MDSAP, Medical Device Single Audit Program. Here is a link, the first one, to the FDA's update uh, given maybe a year and a half ago, end of 2018, I believe. And there's also a, another AAMI uh, initiative. Uh, here's the technical report for this one where they are doing the actual uh, CFR mapping. So they're doing all the A20s, and they're mapping it to this ISO standard to see where there are gaps and what other information needs to be used. So if you're interested in terms of the, the forward-looking direction of where device uh, quality system regulation is going, these links are for you. So there are obviously a lot of topics and content that I didn't get into. Um, I know Ashley Bohm talked about Q12 earlier today, um, but there are a lot of um, topics that we don't have time for, unfortunately, in terms of digital health, software as a medical device. There's a big uh, initiative of the EU's medical device regulations. Um, so there's always questions and, and uh, evolution of combination products. When people think about combination products, there's usually just the pre-filled syringes and other uh, default um, products that people think about, but there's always innovations uh, for different presentations, different technologies that involve multiple different centers uh, for their products. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting field, a very um, uh, active field, both in terms of the industry and, as you can see from uh, the FDA, since 2013, we've been publishing uh, regulations and guidances and uh, additional Federal Register notices very, very quickly. So um, it's just a very, very uh, uh, new field to, to check out. So all the links I sent are current, and you know there's always new stuff to come down the pipe in the future. So I just encourage you to keep an eye out for new uh, things to come in the future. So in summary, there's obviously going to be a lot of questions about who do I go to for certain questions. If you have an application, uh, either in-house or you're going to submit to the agency, uh, the first person you should talk to is definitely the uh, project manager or lead reviewer for your application. Talk to them first, and they should send out uh, emails and communications to the appropriate people. Um, if you have questions about inspection observations, um, the first stop you should always go to is ORA. If you're a biologic uh, manufacturer, potentially you may discuss with the CEDAR biologics uh, inspection team itself. But always go with the inspection teams or centers first. And then, again, centers will assist as needed. And if you have any questions about combination product guidance, policy, product jurisdiction, et cetera, uh, you can always go to OCP. They have a very, very easy um, email combination at FDA.gov that you can always uh, ask questions to. And so I'm a big Pearl Jam fan, and it's just coincidence that the year that we published the Part 4 regulation in 2013 was the year that Pearl Jam last uh, released their last album. And so I can imagine that if Pearl Jam was touring then, you know, they may have a lot of uh, pessimistic sounding songs on that tour in terms of combination products. Indifference, down, sad, just unsure of what to do and where to go in terms of planning their, their facilities operations. But, um, you know, we're speaking now in 2020. Pearl Jam now had a new album just released recently. Um, they were to have a tour, which is obviously postponed right now. But uh, in terms of combination products specifically, uh, I think if Pearl Jam were to sing about them, I think they would have a little more optimistic tone in terms of, of like I mentioned, all the different information that we've published recently. Smile, just breathe. Things are OK. And uh, we're here to help you navigate these regulations and what you have to uh, have at your facilities and your applications. And uh, please ask us questions if you have them. 
in terms of uh, two challenge questions, um, which of the following is not a combination product? An insulin pre-filled syringe, an IV container filled with saline, uh, these uh, combination tablets, or uh, a transdermal patch? And uh, the answer is the tablets, because the other three are combination products. They include both a drug constituent part and a device constituent part. Um, but the tablets are what we would consider combination therapies, uh, products that have two drugs, or uh, in this case, three drugs, do, do not have to follow the combination product regulations in part three or part four. They only have to follow their base um, you know, constituent part regulations in this, in this case, CEDAR. And then in terms of which of the following facilities do not have to be listed on the form, uh, the device specification developers, device component manufacturers, device constituent part manufacturers, or the finished combination product manufacturers? And the answer is uh, the component manufacturers. I think Rose had this information too. So if your device is doing specification development, that's part of design control. And so that's part of the, that's one of the regulations that's called out in part four. Um, and then if you manufacture the finished, finished constituent parts, so a finished device by itself, or the finished combination product that's combined or packaged or labeled with uh, another product, they must be on that form. And so uh, that's, that's, that's all I have for today. Um, I believe there's a lot of questions. There should be a lot of questions. And so I will kick it back to the, uh, the host. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was outstanding. I love the uh, analogy to the Pearl Jam sauce. <laughs> that was really cool. And as you mentioned, we are going to go into Q&A now. Let me go ahead and change our layout here a little bit. And uh, uh, she should be dialed into the uh, bridge so that he'll be able to join us for questions. You can just keep uh, bringing yourself back off mute on your microphone as we go there. Uh, but so uh, we get right to it. I am going to turn it over to uh, Lisa to read our first question. Thank you, Jeff. Our first question is for Ashish. Are you on the line? Ashish? <laughs> And Ashish may still be dialing into the bridge. Ashish, uh, please go ahead and use that 888 number that we uh, sent an email uh, talked about earlier to go ahead and join that. In the meantime, uh, do you have a question ready for uh, Stephen we could go to, Lisa? Yeah, um, OK. This question is for Stephen. Are you you're ready, Stephen? Yes, I'm here. OK, great. Do the PMSR requirements for CPs come into effect in July 2020, or is FDA considering delaying the effective date? Um, sure. So I believe um, there were some requirements that were to be um, and come into effect this uh, summer, and then some that were to be coming into effect next summer. I believe the ones for next summer deal with um, some of the vaccine biologic reporting systems. Um, I have not personally heard any different both in terms of our, our current you know pandemic situation or otherwise um, if you have any specific questions about that maybe email um, the combination at fda.gov uh, address or uh, your application um, project manager I personally haven't heard anything uh, different about that so um, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that okay great thank you another question oh, hi. oh. Welcome. Hi, I'm online. Just, no, yeah, I'm just sort of letting you know. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, this question is for either of you. It was addressed to you. Who needs to be in compliance with CFR Part 4, the ANDA holder or the manufacturer of the drug product? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, ultimately, uh, the application holder has uh, responsibility that the firms they list and proposed for their application are GMP QSR compliant. So if, they, if during our review for pre-approval review, they're not, I mean, the application, 
that would be one element that could be justified as a withhold or a reason not to approve. Um, but each facility that, manu that is a manufacturer uh, or a packager or, or controller or tester, um, as defined in the different regulations, they have their own GMP responsibilities that they uh, must comply with um, on site. So if, if they're not compliant, then they're the ones who actually get the uh, 43 observations, who get, uh, you know, if they're significant observations, if they're surveillance uh, inspections, and they're the ones that could potentially go to, uh, you know, further further regulatory action. So both both individual both uh, entities have responsibilities, and it just it just depends. Uh, you know, they they both be affected depending on non-compliance to GMPs. Okay, great. Um, the next uh, question, I believe, is for Ashish, but um, we'll see. Regarding OTC products, are vaginal antifungals with applicators or liquid dosage forms with dosing cups, for example, ibuprofen, consider, are those considered combination products? So for this, I would actually like to um, direct the, uh, the question asker to there is a guidance for industries called current good manufacturing practice requirements for combination products. And uh, it is a very, very valuable piece of information for all this kind of information. So uh, I would actually like to direct uh, the audience to that guidance. Okay, great. To get, a, to get the most specific answer, yeah. Great. Okay, we have another question for you. For generic applications with an inhalation solution-based dosage form, how many lots of APR, API are required to manufacture submission batches? So there is a guidance for industry question and answers for uh, ANDA applications. And uh, in that guidance, it actually says that a minimum, in general, a minimum of two lots of the drug substance should be used to prepare the three primary batches of drug products. So it's also applicable to innovation solution drug products. OK, great. Uh, this one, again, is for you. With respect to ENL of lyophilized drug products, if the applicant submits a risk assessment and justification that the ENL study can be waived, is that possible? Can you please advise? So this is a very good good question, and uh, I would uh, say yes, please do. Uh, please provide all available justification risk assessment, but the applicant should know that like you know the final call rests with the uh, the assessor and depending on the drug product the information more information may be asked uh, during uh, the review process so the so the applicant should be prepared for that okay great thank you this next question is for Stephen what would you consider the difference between a part and a component Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, so there are um, different definitions of what a constituent part is versus a, like, a component. So um, if you have a pre-filled syringe, the assembled syringe would be the device constituent parts. And um, they could be, these, these products have, um, you know, in terms of that product, probably a 510K uh, application or, you know, a uh, device application with them. So. That would be, and they're also, they have their own regulations in um, CDRH where I believe it's somewhere in the 860 to 890 range of, of 211 CFR, 860 to 890. There is a whole bunch of regulations that define what devices are. And so I think in 880, um, somewhere in there, there's like pre-filled syringes and it says a pre-filled syringe is defined as XXX device and it's a class two device. So those would all be the constituent parts and the components would be like if you had the barrel and you had the piston and you had the, the needle, those would be components of the device. So it's almost like the analogous to having a drug product would be the uh, constituent part and having the active ingredients and the excipients and uh, purified water, et cetera, would be the components of that constituent part. Great. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is about a 356H form. They said that early in April, 
FDA revised the form, the 356-H form, and now it's been removed from the website. Could you please clarify which form they should use for their future submissions? And they reference form 0818 or form um, 32020. Sure, yeah. Um, so when I had created this presentation, um, I think the, the most recent form was the 18 one. Um, so if, if there's one, a newer one that was published in April, um, you, should, you should use the most updated form, so use that one. So I, I don't know anything about it being published and or maybe removed, but um, in, in general, you should use the most uh, current updated form uh, that's, that's available and, and effective. Okay, great. And our next question is, if an ANDA has a sterile injection product in a vial and would like to change to PFS, can this change be made under the same ANDA? Uh, so there is a guidance for basically, uh, is this pre-approval or post-approval? Because uh, like you know, the uh, the regulations are the regulatory requirements are different. If, and for and I'm not sure whether uh, like you know you can have two different container closure system under the same ANDA. For ND I have seen, but for generic products I have not seen. I've usually seen uh, two different ANDAs for uh, like you know for two different container closure system, like for example, wine and PFL. Uh, Steve. If you want to add something, or Lisa, um, I'm not so sure about this specific question. I know we've seen applications uh, uh, request uh, yeah. pre-filled syringe to auto injector or something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, those have been done under same applications, I think. But uh, you know, I'm going to defer the question. Yeah, and this is mostly a. Uh, filing related questions, so I want to, I want to just stay out of it for now. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I think that is all the questions that we have time for today, and I will pass that back to Jeff for a couple of housekeeping announcements. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, that went very, very well. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Stephen. Great presentation. Thank you.